Hello and welcome back to Choir with Knut. Today we're arranging another song for SAB Choir with piano accompaniment. So that's soprano, alto, baritone with piano. Now I usually do soprano, alto, baritone on these episodes uh, because a lot of choirs struggle with finding enough men and particularly for their tenor section. So while I'm not writing these arrangements for a particular choir, I am kind of of the opinion that if you struggle to find enough tenors, you can put all the men together and have them as just the baritone section. And if, you play, if you're performing a song with a piano, you don't actually need the bass singers because the, the piano then takes over the job as the bass player. The song that we're arranging today is called Crazy and it's by the American band uh, Niles Barkley. And it consists of uh, singer-songwriter CeeLo Green, who's had a few hits outside of this band as well, and producer Danger Mouse. Now this song, when it came out, it was in 2006, and it was a huge success. And it's kind of, it's, to give you some idea, the Rolling Stone magazine, I think, listed it as their number one song of the noughties. So it was huge. And the reason why I thought it'd be good for me to arrange it is because I am learning it for a piano duo that I'm playing it. So I'm playing piano uh, accompanying a singer. And uh, we thought about doing the song. So I thought, well, because I'm learning the song, might as well just do a choral arrangement of it as well. So let's head over to my workstation and get started arranging Crazy by Niles Barkley. As usual, the first thing you'll want to do is make sure that you've familiarized yourself with the song. Um, the, I think the number one mistake people make when arranging a song is that they just haven't spent enough time with the song to really know how they're going to be transforming it into a new arrangement. So this song has three verses and they kind of are vaguely all the same, if you will. The song kind of has this very hypnotizing, constant quality to it. You have a, you have this bass line which is running throughout, playing the same rhythm pretty much the whole way. You have some ooze in the background, and you've got a few things being added, like in the choruses. But most of all, I'd say that the production of the song is quite static, and I think that is intentionally so. Uh, it's trying to kind of lull you in. I mean, the, the title of the song is crazy and the the singer of the song is wondering all right am i you know does this make me crazy is that you know what is it that is uh <laughs> qualifying me as being crazy and maybe the idea of going of sort of going in circles with the production and being like oh it stays the same and oh i'm still asking these questions i'm not sure is an important element in the song and i think that might be something to consider taking into an arrangement I was reading up about what the inspiration of the song is, because it is it is a very different song. It doesn't really sound like anything from the time it came out. This was in uh, 2006. And apparently it's, uh, it's a combination of two things. It's, uh, um, it's sampled off of um, a spaghetti western, so like um, an Italian uh, western film from the 60s. There's a song that they've sampled. And also the lyrics are based on a conversation um, between the songwriters where they, were, where, they were, where they were talking about how very often an artist is only really taken seriously if they are a bit mentally unstable or crazy. And so they were talking about, does it, well, if I did this thing, does that make me crazy? And they were kind of going into that. Uh, I think it's very, it's a very interesting concept. I think there might be some merit to that idea um, it's not unusual, especially for, you know, big artists in the limelight to get a lot of press and attention if it looks like they're, uh, if they're struggling a bit mentally. Like a very good example is Britney Spears, who for a long time was struggling mentally and she got so much media coverage. Um, I mean, one might debate whether or not it made people take her more seriously, but it's, um, it's a story that's often told about artists in popular media. So with that in mind, um, I'll have listened to the song, learnt it, and then I will start to look at covers. 
So I'm just going to quickly look for some covers and then I'll just do a really quick fire round <laughs> where I talk about each cover and what I could take from them. So I picked out three covers that I thought were interesting to look at, and these were all a cappella covers. I tried to find uh, choir covers, uh, as I'm going to be doing a, a choral arrangement, but most of the ones that I found that I thought were interesting were a cappella covers. And I mean, there's there's some crossover there, so I figured, you know, yeah, I'll just I'll just go with that. Uh, the first one I found was an all male a cappella group, and this was a transcription arrangement, so uh, it had a lot of elements from the original, but they were quite creative with it, they did change things up, so uh, they kind of avoided that uh, repetitive nature that I was talking about from the song. They had different soloists taking turns, and they had a beatboxer, and they were quite, I thought they were quite creative uh, and got a lot of mileage out of the song by moving stuff around and giving all the members a chance to shine. Um, production wise it was also very polished um, and I thought uh, yeah a really really good arrangement so I'd recommend you check it out I'm gonna link to it on the screen of course and uh, the second one I found was of a mixed a cappella group and um, yeah with all these I found they all used beatboxes so they all took away that challenge of who does the percussion uh, I'm not gonna be using a beatboxer in my choir so that'll be the piano's job essentially, unless I have some sort of idea when I'm uh, getting started. We shall see. Uh, second group also used a soloist, and this group, um, it kind of, it made the song go through three phases if you will. Started out slow, and then picked up into tempo for the second verse, and then went down to like the initial tempo at the end. And I think that's a, a, a very simple and good way to get some kind of interest out of a song where you start slowly and then make it faster and then slow down. I thought that was good. It used uh, quite a lot of complex harmony, which is interesting. You know, the idea of, oh, what's happening? And, oh, it's all like sounding weird. And um, yeah, it was cool. You should check it out. This one did use the same solos throughout. I am a bigger fan of trying to get the other voices involved in sort of interaction with words and stuff. Uh, but you might, uh, you know, get some inspiration from watching it. So I'll link that on the screen now. And finally, there is one uh, with another mixed a cappella group with a beatboxer. And this one also used a soloist throughout and uh, did the same thing as the previous one where it starts a bit slow and then picks up. Interestingly, this one had a much faster tempo than the original. But I thought there were some good things in there. Um... For some of these videos, I did find the, the production of the actual video made it a little tricky to hear some details in the arrangements. Um, but that's kind of not really what I'm interested in at the moment. I'm just looking to see what sort of interesting things have people done. And it seems like the idea of passing around uh, parts is an option. The idea of changing the tempo is an option. Um, so yeah, the next thing I'm going to do is to transcribe. So I always do this. I always transcribe the original um, for two reasons. First of all, it helps with the learning process. It helps me pick up on details in the music, just write anything in that I think might be useful. And then if I choose to use it or not, that's what I'll decide later on. Um, and also it just gets down the basic structure of the song. I'll be able to see sort of the overarching sections and just get my imag imagination going because I'll start to think okay well here it goes up in this part of its range so I can do this and there it goes quite low maybe I should move it there uh, because I'll be using a mixed choir you know I might need to change the key around a bit because maybe I want to have the altos singing the chorus in their high range and then that might merit a, you know a different key than the original but I'm just going to take some time now um and uh, transcribe and then I'll talk about what I did and what I'm going to do next. All right, I've pretty much transcribed the song, so let's just have a look at what I thought was important to get in there. In this song, it was principally just the melody and the um, chord symbols and 
bass line. Uh, I did write down the string line in the choruses, which I'll get to, but there isn't really a whole lot other in it that I think are crucial to transfer onto a choir with piano. So you'll see in the start here, I've put it just in the alto range for now. I mean, CeeLo Green is singing in the alto range. It goes up to Tennessee. Um, so that kind of makes sense. But I might move stuff around when I choose how to arrange it. So I've just written in exactly how it goes with the bass line. Dun, 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 dun. And that just kind of loops through the whole song. This is all pretty, you know, pretty straightforward. This is just the melody. Uh, the melody in the song is very syncopated and it is a little bit dangerous to have very syncopated lines sung by an ensemble. Um, it's possible, of course. It's much easier to have an ensemble sing on the kind of obvious beats. Um, but with rehearsal time, it can be fine. Just keep it in mind that if a line is very heavily syncopated, that's going to take some extra rehearsal time. Um, but this song, the, the, melody line, the melody line in the song is very syncopated, so there isn't really a way around that. But yeah, I mean, this is just the first verse. I've not written in first verse, I just use rehearsal marks usually, just to keep it simple. Uh, sometimes people can get a bit bogged down in, is this the pre-chorus or is it the post-verse and what is this section called? And this is the bridge, but is it the bridge one or the bridge two? Just to avoid those kinds of situations, I'll just be like, it's letter A, it's letter B. And then, you know, what people choose to call it isn't really relevant for the performers. They're just here to sing from start to finish and they need someone to tell them where to go from when you're rehearsing. So yeah, I'm definitely a fan of... Uh, rehearsal marks over, you know, section, um, sorry, um, writing down which structural part of the song it is. You can do if you prefer doing that, but I find rehearsal marks are unambiguous, and unambiguous is always a really good approach. Okay, chorus, there's fine. There is a good chance that'll be block harmonies because the, the chorus is supposed to be quite loud. There is this string line, which is nice, and um, it's uh, if you saw the previous episode, this would be an example of uh, an ostinato line. It goes, it's the same through every chorus, um, and um, I think it's probably worth preserving. But uh, again, when I start ranging, I might decide that actually this doesn't work. We'll see. I mean, it's it kind of yeah, it does. So yeah, it does work in counterpoint mostly. No funny, no funny uh, parallel, moving, parallel moving fifths or anything like that. <laughs> okay, so that's just the chorus, then you've got another verse, and this is interesting. So they start the second verse and the third verse on a major. I wrote it in as a dominant because I'll probably make it a dominant. But that's kind of how they make them sound different. And I think if they started them just on the minor chord as they did before, it would be it would be like same, same, same the whole way. So even just having that small change makes the, uh, the the two last verses stand out a little bit. So I think that's good, especially if you have a song that's very repetitive, do something. And they've done that here. And yeah, I've just written in the melody, uh, keeping in these little like unvoiced drops. These are very common in R&B based music. Um, I think they're a useful thing to just keep in, just write them in using crosshead, um, which kind of implies that there's no real pitch with a little drop. Um, that's kind of, that's part of the style, so keep that. Um, and yeah, there's a good chance I'll keep, um, I'll keep the first verse as a solo perhaps. I did like the idea of keeping it, uh, slower. I might not make it slower as such, I might just make it kind of less rhythmic and then have it be like full rhythmic later. Anytime you have tempo changes in arrangement is when all the singers start to freak out. <laughs> uh, you know, and not so, not because they can't do them, but because it, it makes them concerned because they want to be able to, to do them really well. So uh, if you can avoid tempo changes or put tempo changes in a place where there's like a really clear count in, then that will help uh, the singers to be like, okay, you know what? I can do this because I can watch the conductor and just go one, two, three, four, and then they know which, where they're going. 
This is this is true for all performers, by the way, not just singers. Uh, I'm just saying it here because I'm doing a call arrangement, obviously. But yeah, there's there's a good chance I'll keep the whole arrangement more or less in tempo. But again, we'll see. I might choose to have it, you know, have a soloist kind of direct the flow of the music a bit. That's also fine. As long as there's something clear to follow, then that should work. Uh, anyway, I'm just going on tangents here because the fact is it's there's not really a whole lot in this transcription. It's just the melody with the string line and the bass and yeah, that's it. Um, again, I tried to write it out as best I could. I left out a lot of the um, runs that CeeLo Green does because uh, that's sound that sounds really good for you know if you have a good solo singer a bunch of people trying to sing it together particularly if it's like a lower ability choir it's going to sound messy uh you know no need to put it in you can have uh, the soloist if you have a soloist they can you know mess around a bit with the line and that'll, that'll be cool um if you know for absolutely certain that they can do it then do it but even with experienced ensembles like london contemporary voices Whenever I put runs into the arrangements, we always have to keep going over and over and over to make sure that they're exactly in time. So it's, you're kind of asking for trouble a bit. So, you know, simple is fine. Don't be afraid of simple. All right, here is, yeah, we've got the last verse. And again, it's just the same. The harmony doesn't change much. The, the melody changes, but the sort of the basic structure is the same the whole way. So this is all fine. Um, yeah, and so the outro, I haven't decided what to do. So I wrote it in, as you can see, but I didn't write in CeeLo Green's improvisation because I think that's not important. This is just kind of, I wrote in what's the harmony of the original, but I might choose to do something different here. We'll see. It depends on what direction I decide to take the arrangement in. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and start arranging now. I've got some ideas about what I want to do. I'll see if I can get it to work. I did like this idea of having this constant factor, which the original has. And I thought that it might be interesting to put in um, some sort of pedal note. So a pedal note is just a note that stays the same regardless of what's happening around it. Uh, it's usually put in the bass, but I was thinking about... Um, it's actually... A song that I wrote, which I'm releasing later this year, um, as part of my my upcoming album launch, uh, where I took this concept of um, middle C. Middle C is being played every crotchet throughout the whole song, pretty much. And so you get this constant thing in the middle that's just going, 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 and then there's stuff happening around it. And I think that's a pretty cool device to use. And I think just to avoid this being too close to the original, but, you know, maintaining some of that, um, uh, some of the uh, intent of the original. I, th I think I might try to go for something like that. Okay, we'll see. I'll have to try it out. But that's an idea that popped up and I thought, hmm, that might be interesting. And it'll be like a little bit different. You know, we'll get something that's not exactly like the original. It has something new about it. But yeah, we'll see how I get going. So I'm just going to Go and arrange it, and I'll be back when I'm done. I think my arrangement's pretty much finished, so uh, let's have a look at what I did. Now you'll notice I've already kind of started doing the layout here. Um, I'll have to go through this in greater detail later. Right now it's uh, approaching 10 o'clock and I'm really tired and I don't want to have to do more on this like this evening. So I'll, I'll have a look and sort it out off camera before I publish it. But let's go into panorama mode and look at what I've done. So here, um, yeah, this is, this will be fine in the actual score. I decided to start with, let me just zoom in a little bit and get rid of this because we don't need that. Started with optional alto, so, alto solo and I've done this for a few arrangements uh, and it's just a, it's a very simple way of starting a song. Start with a solo or with, you know, a unison line. Um, 
the musical director can decide, okay, you know what, we'll have both sopranos altos. It's kind of, it's up to whoever is leading the choir. I went with this idea of the re repetitive notes in the left hand here, a G, say so we have a G drone, and it did actually turn out to be the bottom note for uh, most of the sections where it's in. But that's like just a way of starting it where it's a little bit different. You know, you give the audience something new. But I just used the original harmony on top. So you can see I just have like very simple chords here in the right hand. And alto soloist. This continues until the second part of the first verse. Now I add in a bass note under the drone note. Um, just following the chord progression. And I have the baritones and sopranos doing oohs. And again, you know, the, the musical director might decide, okay, all altos join in here, depending on whether you're using microphones, whether, you know, they think, uh, it's, they think it's going to be loud enough. Again, that's more of a musical director sort of thing to sort out. Um, just ooze, following the chords, doing the melody. And here, first chorus, I decided, okay, why not just start with like a quiet chorus? Try and make this more of a slow burn. So just have everyone in block harmonies, and you'll see I, I reuse these harmonies every time the chorus comes up. But I've put them in such a range that they can be sung quietly by all parts, but they can also be sung with a bit more power by all parts. And I chose to put the string line from the original in the piano. So that's just block chords, the string line being the top note. And again, the drone just continues. There's no real bass note happening in this chorus. It's just quiet building slowly, having that like tension. A nice advantage of having a drone note is that it builds a lot of tension, particularly if you look at say this A flat major seven, where you have, um, maybe not so obvious here, but essentially your, your drone note is gonna be the seventh in the chord. That always sounds very tense and it clashes with the root, which is a semitone above. Um, but that just gives it like a really intense drive. And the, I think it's really good uh, that's a really good thing to think about when you're using drone notes, is how can you build a lot of tension by putting chords on top that clash with it. Which is then later resolved, of course. Okay, so we're building here until we come to verse 2. And here, just block harmonies from the sopranos altos and the baritones are singing the melody. And um, this is fairly straightforward stuff, it's just I've got the bass line from the original. I reharmonized slightly because I figured you've got a nice little C here. Why not resolve to an F minor? You know, the C is the dominant of F. So that pr produces a nice uh, resolution. The original uses A flat, which is a closely related chord to F's, so to F minor. So why not? Um, and then I have a little bit of color response from the sopranos altos, just like on the, on the, the beats. Nothing too crazy, just to create a bit more like texture. Uh, baritones just singing chorus, uh, sorry, singing the verse. Nothing particularly egregious here. Building into a block harmony chorus, and I actually went with quite a lot of block harmony in the song because it's uh, it's a soul song, and so having some block harmonies uh, will make it sound you know like a soul song. So I opted. Because, uh, yeah, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the rhythms in the song are a bit tricky. But it's a very well-known song, and if all the parts are doing the same rhythm, it's kind of, it's easy enough to just have them say the words in rhythm a few times, and they will probably be able to deal with it. At least I assume that this Knut's Community Choir is going to be able to deal with it. Okay, so they're just singing the chords. Again, keep making sure that the baritones in this part uh, aren't going much higher than a C. Um, there's a bit, a little bit later when they go a bit higher, but that's fine because that's a high note. Uh, sorry, that's a loud note. Ha ha ha, bless your soul. I'll just block harmonies, block harmonies. You really think you're in control? Now this is nice. I've got this high note here building into the chorus. And now I reuse the exact same chords, but it's now loud. And because I've just because I've very consciously put it in a range where it'll be possible for them to project, uh, then that should sound really cool. And now we've got the doubling of the bass down the octave and the piano, You're just giving it a bit more uh, of a, a big sweepy chorus type of feel. 
and that just builds towards the end, ending on this nice big G dominant, and then this nice thing where you have the big chord, boom, and then you just have the piano player just like drag his finger down and hit the bottom C on the keyboard. That's always a really cool thing to do. And here they're in unison octaves. Um, so it's a nice big moment, the piano disappears and everyone's in unison octaves. Breaking into harmony here and then continuing as before with block harmonies. I've added in kind of some response parts here. Um, fragrances there in all, all I remember. I just added in this bit just to give it a bit of a raise um, and also just keeping it a block harmonies. Uh, if you've got some soul singers this will sound really quite cool. Um, here they go back into unison octaves and then break into harmony. So this thing about having them go unison, block harmonies, unison, block harmonies. It's always quite cool. It creates this funny texture and then anything they do in unison octaves will be quite accentuated. Um, and then the block harmonies will be less so. But it's just, it's a really cool effect, I think. Just make sure that the voice leading always works and it'll be fine. Right, and here again, woes building up into the last part of the last verse with the same thing, with a big chord here. This should be a minor chord actually, boom. It is minor in the notation. And uh, ever since I was little, this is block harmonies. And again, the same. This chorus is pretty much just block harmonies. Now I decrescendo because I decided to go back into you just octaves here, and slowly but surely they get into the last chorus, and then I bring back this G drone. So I didn't really, you don't really have to use the idea for drone. Same as with an ostinato, you don't have to use it the whole song. Using it for part of it, in this case the, the start and the end, uh, you know, kind of just book ends the song quite nicely. And then going back to a choir chorus again, they'll be like, oh yeah, we're going back to the choir chorus. Still the same sentiment, even though we've gone through some high notes, some loud bits, some big sweeping emotions, and now we're back to quiet with a drone underneath. And this is almost exactly the first chorus, just with the new words, because this song annoyingly does change the words of the, of the chorus every time. Uh, that's just a song, so that's just what we have to work with. But yeah, just playing through. Now I decided for my outro. I was just gonna have the sopranos do the melody on their own. They've been singing the melody for all the choruses, so they they know it. They don't have to relearn anything. And we've got altos and baritones harmonizing, and they just harmonize on the notes they'd be harmonizing on anyway. So again, not having to relearn anything, just doing this, doing what you did before, just on an ooh and slightly simplified, like so. With everyone ending on probably, and finishing just on G dominant, or it's actually just a G. Uh, I should write this in properly. It's not a G7 at all. It's just a normal G. Finishing on the dominant and just stopping there. And yeah, I think that'll be quite nice. Um, if, um, you know, if you have a choir that can put a bit of like gospel sound on it, that'll be perfect. But it's kind of, it's written in a way that should suit most community choirs. And yeah, that's pretty much my arrangement finished. That's it for today's episode. And as I mentioned in the previous episodes, I'm trying to put together some simple recordings of these songs, uh, of the arrangements I've done, so you can get some idea of what they sound like. Uh, still working on those, but I'll see if I can get some out very soon. Remember to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and follow me on the social media. You can find me at Knut's Music on both Facebook and Instagram. And I'll see you in the next episode. Nah.